Deadpool attempted to tackle the tropes of superhero films and turn them on their head with a crass sense of humor that was well-deserved. Then the screenwriters didn't know what fridging was, and we ended up with Deadpool 2. My name's Cable. I'm here for the kid. Kids give us a chance to be better than we used to be. He needs you. Daddy's got this. I ain't letting Cable get to him. But I can't do this alone. I need your help, ladies. Understatement of the year. You're absolutely right. I like this guy. Give him a chance. This is the Superhero Pantheon. On this podcast, we take one superhero film a week and decide whether it should be in the Pantheon, the pile of shame, or somewhere in between. My name is Jerome Cusan. You can find me on Twitter at JeromeC1985. You can find additional episodes of this podcast, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and all of your favorite podcast apps through the real world. We strongly encourage you to leave a four- or five-star review so as to help people discover this show and the great work that the folks at the real world are doing. By the time you are listening to this, our, the latest episode of Mars Investigated, episode four, where we discuss two books and a movie, should be out. We also have Flooping the Pig as they are talking about Adventure Time, and there will be movies with Matt Waters and Ben Phillips. If you would like to interact with us or send feedback, you could do so in two ways. First, send an email to SuperheroPantheon at gmail.com. Second, find us on Twitter at HeroPantheon. My co-host for this week and every week will be Brian DeBrain. He can be found on Twitter at Brian DeBrain. Brian, this was probably my biggest disappointment of 2018. I'm, of course, talking about Deadpool 2. I was a really big fan of the first Deadpool, and... I don't know. There was just something about this movie that did not click, even upon rewatch. This movie definitely did not click for me nearly as well as the first one. But I know in looking back at some of the feedback from other people, I know that I am... I am the loser on this one that the general consensus is that this movie was in many ways, just as funny and much better directed based on what I saw. So Brian, I'm going to, I know that I'm fighting a losing battle in this one. I wouldn't say fighting a losing battle. I mean, we all have our opinions, right? It's just, this feels more of like a complete movie. I just felt like Tim Miller, you can kind of tell it was kind of his first movie in Deadpool one. And yeah, Deadpool one had more of the heart, but I don't know what it is sometimes with just stupid comedies where you just sit, kind of sit back and laugh. You know what I mean? And this one, I was just laughing like it felt like the whole time. And this is like the third time I've watched this movie. And I just laugh all, almost every freaking line I just laugh. Whether it's like a half-hearted laugh or like a stupid laugh or like a really belly-aching laugh. Because like there's some lines in this that are just hilarious. You know what I mean? And some timing and some of the gags. Um, and I know the fridging thing bothers a lot of people, but in the end, I mean, he just brought her back anyway. I felt like with the whole time, uh, you know, with the time machine or the time watch thing that they can just go back in time and fix things as a plot device, you kind of figured, well, it's a time travel movie, so he's probably just going to bring her back anyway. So as soon as I saw her die, I was like, oh, she's just going to come back in the end. Like he's going to talk to Cable, something like that. I mean, anytime you're dealing with time travel and you got a dead lover, something is going to change. And we even kind of got that in Captain America a little bit with him reuniting with uh, Peggy Carter. So, you know, it, it just, you know, it happens and it was kind of obvious. I know it still bothers people, but it, they kind of fixed it at the end, right? I mean, maybe they didn't realize it, but they just kind of fixed the problem at the end. And not only that, they kind of fixed the timeline issues with some of these shitty X-Men movies too as well. So credit to that. Um, you know, it's not nearly as strong in, in terms of the heart, in, you know, of the first one. But, you know what I mean? It's just like you can kind of just sit back and kind of like enjoy this movie with friends in the background or whatever and just throw it on. Um, I think even the PG-13, I know there's a PG-13 version, that's kind of the joke of it, but even I think a PG-13 version of this movie kind of works, like, if if you put this on FX, I think it's going to do decent ratings all the time, and, you know, despite the editing, I think you'd have to do on this movie, I still think it comes off as a fun PG-13 comedy even then. We will get to the fridging in just a moment, but I do want to talk about and respond to what you said about the 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 genre of this movie as the a lot of the heart 
uh, seemed to be left behind as there was a new director, Tim Miller, decided that he would not return to action for the sequel. Uh, there were some creative differences with lead actor Ryan Reynolds. And of course, Ryan Reynolds is such an important part of this movie, not only because he plays Deadpool, but because he is a credited screenwriter and a producer. This is this role is basically built for him. He is the only person, I believe, that could play Deadpool and play him well. Miller later stated that he left the sequel because he didn't want to make some stylized movie. So in thinking about Tim Miller and the fact that it feels like a lot of the heart left this movie. I almost wonder if, the, if that if that is Tim Miller related, because in watching the latest Terminator sequel, which I'm not going to spoil, I think a lot of what that franchise has been lacking is heart in the last three Terminator movies. And it feels like by bringing in Tim Miller, they actually got some of that back. I don't think the action was as good as Terminator 2, but I, I, I think they got a lot of the emotional beats right, and I'm wondering if that was the problem with Deadpool 2. Um, maybe, perhaps, and, like, at this point, I still haven't seen Terminator, I read some spoilers on accident, and I kind of got frustrated at what they did with some of the characters, so I just didn't even watch it, but I get what you're saying, but at the same time, I felt like, with Deadpool, the kind of character that he is, I think the first movie should have that kind of heart because you need that in the origin story. And the second one, I just wanted more of like him being Deadpool. So I think I got satisfied in that end. So I think what Ryan Reynolds was looking for and maybe some of the general audience was looking for was just more of that same kind of like, um, you know, Deadpoolness that we're used to, the stupidity, the dumb jokes, the inside baseball references and all that kind of thing. Um, cause if you kind of just repeat the first movie, it'll be like, what, at what story can you tell that gets to the heart of Deadpool? You already got to the heart of Deadpool. You know what he's all about. You know, what it has his, um, you know, who has his heart, right? So basically I think that they couldn't come up with a different story, um, to kind of satisfy that because I think the first one you needed, like I said, that heart, the second one, you just kind of go with that comedy and kind of go with it because I think that's what worked the most. See, and you say that, and yet I, I actually do think that they were trying to go for that. I think that they were going for this combination of shock value. That's clearly what they were doing in the beginning based on what we see in the opening credits. But I think they were also going for what you were saying with, with more of the comedy. So it feels like they were trying to have their cake and eat it too. And what they ended up doing is they did this, this fridging action, which is something that shockingly I had never heard of associated with comic book movies and TV shows and, and books, but it, tr it really does make a lot of sense when you think about it. Uh, this is a term. It is shorthand for quote unquote women in refrigerators. It was coined because of a scene in green lantern, which is very funny considering what happens at the end of this movie. Uh, the green lantern character found his girlfriend's body in a fridge what it ultimately in the big picture of it does refers to the fact that many characters in comics, movies, and television shows are sacrificed or injured to help the development of the male hero. In the first few minutes of Deadpool 2, we quickly see that the movie embraces this aspect of fridging. Vanessa is immediately sacrificed to help Wilson become close to the X-Men and ultimately save Russell. However, when asked about the term, the Deadpool writers said they didn't know what fridging was. So here we have this this movie where they are trying to do all these different things and counter the stereotypes of superhero movies. And what they ultimately do is they fall into the biggest trap of all. And what they said is what I think they did is they, they created this false binary. Brian, do you know what a false binary is? Uh, I think I know it is where it's the assumption that there's only two ans or two possible answers to it, uh, a question or something like that. Very good, Brian. You are you get you get a gold star for today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It is a, it is a tough concept, but you have essentially nailed it. The idea is that you have to do one thing or the other, and you created a false binary. That is what the writers did here, because what they essentially said is that there was a debate about whether Wade and Vanessa should break up or whether Vanessa should simply be killed. And that's what would best drive the character of Deadpool for the rest of the movie. And ultimately we get Ryan Reynolds saying multiple times that there is lazy writing going on throughout this movie, especially towards the end with some of the action sequences and some of the way that they are able to write themselves out of different holes. But yet in this case, we have this false binary where we ultimately decide that Vanessa is going to be fridged instead of thinking of anything else to do. And that ultimately is the big, 
biggest problem that I have with this movie. The fact that Vanessa was killed at the beginning of this movie really took it out of me, especially the first time I watched it. And I wasn't too thrilled the second time that it happened because this was the heart of the first Deadpool. And you are removing that from this movie. And I think the movie suffers because of that, because spoiler alert, TJ Miller is no Marina Baquin. Listen, I get the frustration. So, my only thinking is, like, what do you do with Vanessa then? Does she become part of the team? Does she join him? Does she become this thing where it's like, you know, like on The Flash, does like she become like Iris West and kind of become the support system to him? I don't know. I don't know how they could have worked it out. But I don't even know if she wanted to be in the movie that long. That Well, Brian, you, are, you and I are not getting paid millions of dollars to do this. But these screenwriters are getting paid millions of dollars, and they are supposed to be creative individuals. So the logic is, is that they should be able to figure it out. I get you. But I also keep thinking, like, did she want to come back for, like, you know, more scenes? Did she just want to come back for a few scenes? I don't know. Like, maybe it was a scheduling thing that they never kind of revealed, but I don't want to just assume that, you know what I mean? But, you know, it's Hollywood, and everyone's kind of ignorant in their own ways. But at least, I guess, the writers kind of figured it out and maybe have a kind of, kind of learning experience from this. And maybe in their next movie, they're going to kind of touch on this in a tongue-in-cheek way. Probably in, like, another dead In the next Deadpool movie, there will be some kind of joke with a fridge and either maybe a dude in a fridge. I don't know. But something will be referenced to it, I think. If there ever is a third movie, that will undoubtedly happen. I have that's very clear to me. Uh, there was a lot of controversy surrounding T.J. Miller's behavior in the months leading up to this film's release. Ryan Reynolds made a statement that Miller will not be invited back to perform in any follow-up films. The incidents include. Miller being part of the sexual abuse allegations that came up during the Harvey Weinstein scandal. Miller was also arrested after calling 911 while he was aboard an Amtrak traveling from Washington, D.C. to New York Penn Station and claiming that a female passenger has a bomb in her bag. And he was probably also not invited back because he was a dickhead on the set of Silicon Valley. Yeah, that's pretty much everything that I heard about him last year. And I was kind of like, ah, oh, that sucks, you know, um... Because he's really funny, but maybe there's kind of this darkness to him that kind of comes from that funniness, you know what I mean? But there, I don't know. I don't know if he's just kind of like kind of a druggie or whatever, but he does seem kind of like a druggie. I hate to say that, but because I do, I did follow him on Twitter a little bit, and his jokes were kind of like kind of weird and not really the same kind of jokes that he has like in a stage show. So I don't know. His personality is just kind of weird, but it kind of sucks because he was so funny in this, but I understand why he can't go back. And that character's kind of been written off anyway. So, Brian, I have uh, – this is not in our notes, but I just wanted to point this out because I heard this on a podcast yesterday. We have been mispronouncing one of the stars of this movie completely incorrectly when we did it through Deadpool 2. If we did a Joker podcast, we would have been pronouncing this actor's name incorrectly as well. So the person that I'm referring to is one of the stars of Atlanta. She plays Domino in this movie. The way that she pronounce her na- pronounces her name, Brian, is Zasi Bates. Uh, okay, there you go. Uh, I don't know if that's just kind of like something we just assumed or misread, but it's one of those things where it's like the Berenstein Bears. Yes, this, uh, this is something that she put on her Instagram account just yesterday. So it is pretty amazing that we have been doing this all wrong for the last year or so. And now now I feel bad because my last name is often gets mispronounced. So I'm very used to this fact. But I just want to make it clear that I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that I pronounce Zazie Bates' name correctly, finally. And eventually I'll get Taika Waititi uh, or what, whatever. I'll get his name right eventually, too. <laughs> we will see about that. The footage of the X-Men closing the door... That, that happens in, in the early part of the film was shot on the set of Dark Phoenix and sent over to the Deadpool 2. Hindsight being 2020, Brian, that was probably the best best scene from Dark Phoenix. Yes, and just uh, just put that into perspective. Dark Phoenix came 13 months after this movie. Right, and it was it was originally supposed to come out in November, supposed to come out in February. They came out in June, and of course, it completely bombed at the box office earlier this year. And we will probably talk more about the film again next year when we come back around to putting it into the Pantheon, the Pile of Shame, or somewhere in between. Ryan Reynolds personally offered Rob Delaney the role of Peter after seeing him in Catastrophe. I I, I almost don't believe that Ryan Reynolds would watch Catastrophe because it just seems so, it seems so different to what I typically would associate Ryan Reynolds with. Um, I've, I've never seen it either, but, you know, 
good for him for watching those like low key kind of you know shows to kind of find these like different actors for certain roles that you would never think of. You know what I mean? So good for him on that because that he, he filled the role well. I think. We mentioned the Terminator earlier. The playground they fight in at the end is the same one that was used for Sarah's nightmare in Terminator Two. <sighs> More everything's just coming around to Terminator. Everything. I guess the universe is calling me to watch this movie, but I guess I have to wait till it's on streaming so I don't have to like you know waste my time at a theater. Wow, that's a that's a heavy shot. Uh, do you want to hear? Let's talk about Matt Damon, who's in this movie. The actor playing Redneck Number Two is credited as Dickie Greenleaf. Redneck Number Two is actually played by Matt Damon in heavy, heavy prosthetic makeup. Dickie Greenleaf is the name of Jude Law's character in the talented Mr. Ripley, whom Damon's character murders and impersonates. So there is a lot of levels to this, of course. He was in Mr. Ripley. This is also the second comic book movie that Matt Damon has done a cameo in after his incredible cameo in Thor Ragnarok. Yeah, and let's not okay. Yeah, it was great because he had the the you know the uh, the belly and everything and the beard, and I couldn't even tell it was him until the second time I saw it. But the other guy was Alan Tudyk, correct? Because that like, come on, Alan Tudyk's great. Alan Tudyk is pretty amazing as well, and. Of course, this movie had doubled the budget, so of course they did everything they could to make this more of a summer blockbuster. And even at the end of the movie, the music that swallows over Deadpool's death scene near the end of the film is the same score used in Logan for Wolverine's death scene, which I have very mixed feelings about. Because Logan is amazing, and it feels like, whether it was inadvertent or whether it was conscious, it feels like this movie was trying to ape a lot of what Logan was trying to do. Yeah, and I think it was just kind of tongue-in-cheek, but also poking fun at, you know, Hugh Jackman. I guess Hugh Jackman kind of, you know, it was too late for him to answer the call of doing a Deadpool Wolverine team-up movie. And they kind of just poke fun at it, and it kind of makes Deadpool kind of depressed because he never gets that chance to have that team-up movie, and they joke about that too. So, uh, you know, it's just more inside baseball stuff that it's tongue-in-cheek, but, you know, at least the majority of the audience gets the joke. That is for sure. All right, let's finally get to the categories. Let's talk about the heroes. Ver- Vanessa is, of course, fridged in the first five minutes. I don't want to dwell on this too much. Uh, we, I, I think that the issue is that we are expected to care about this. And then they, they bring her back at the end after some time travel. And I guess the question that this raises in my mind is, so what are we going to do with Vanessa in the third one? Is she going to be pregnant? Because that isn't great either. Is she going to be more involved in the action? That's what I'm certainly hoping for, especially because TJ Miller will not be involved. I love the idea of Deadpool failing to become an X-Man because he's too much of a rebel, especially again, seeing dark Phoenix kind of gives this some perspective. I do like the idea of him trying to form his own team and all but Domino dies terribly. And I think that scene, I think it works a lot better on rewatch for me than it did the first time, because I was still mad that they killed Vanessa and it's like, so what am I supposed to care or not? But it on rewatch, I think that scene in particular definitely works and is built up to really well. Yeah, I really love the scene where he's choosing the team members very much, you know, so like Mystery Men, which we reviewed last year, and it reminded me of that a lot. So that that was a nice little nod, whether that was intended or not. But um, just the random cameos, Brad Pitt. Um, I forget which his first name, but he's a Scars Guard. He's the Scars Guard that is a, a Pennywise the Clown. Um, he's the one with the the spit. And then there's like that also mention of. Uh, um, the Mojo Planet. I thought that was a crazy little Easter egg that I didn't even pick up on at first. But if you if you remember the X Men cartoon and they go to the Mojo Planet, it's like this battle planet where he pits these different fighters from around the universe against each other for you know universe tel- universal television ratings or whatever, and it's just ridiculous. And I thought that was an amazing nod because that's that's such a deep cut that like there could potentially be a movie down the line on the Mojo Planet. So that was crazy. And then the you know just them dying and I I thought it was funny because like there was so much hype about Deadpool two being like this setup for the X Force movie and I felt like maybe that was never the plan at all. And once they heard that, they just incorporated it just to make fun of it, just to kind of make fun of the fans, thinking like the fans know it all and like this X Force team is coming and they set up this big scene and they just end up dying. So I thought that was like the big joke of it all, that there won't be no X Force movie at all. It was just like this big joke and that, you know, the only, you know, lingering thing that we get is Domino. Right. And of course, Domino is great. She's undoubtedly the best part, the best new character 
in this movie, I think, even more so than Josh Brolin. I think Josh Brolin, the fact that he was able to play Thanos so well, nail that character. The fact that I think he also did a good job playing Cable. I mean, I think it's a testament to just how good of a performer he is in these comic book movies. Because I think he's taken two characters that I think would be extremely difficult to portray on screen and has done them extremely well. And for me, I think he is also a really positive addition. I think Zazie Bates, I mean, I think she is, she's one of my favorite performers. I think she was really wasted in Joker. She definitely at least got one scene to kind of showcase her abilities here. I kind of would like to see her, maybe not a movie, but in this world of Disney Plus and Hulu shows, I hope that there is a way to get Domino more of a showcase, even beyond the Deadpool universe. Although certainly if there is a Deadpool 3 or an X-Force, I would I would definitely like to see her. We also get uh, some of Fire Fist. And, I mean, he's kind of, he's just kind of there. I Kids in movies generally annoy me, and that was undoubtedly the case here. T.J. Miller is in this movie, and it's kind of gross, knowing what the allegations are, what they are. So as far as the heroes go, I think it's kind of all over the place. Ryan Reynolds is good in parts, but I I also feel like at two hours, this movie is way too long. And I think that this movie, in a lot of ways, suffers from bloat as far as having too many hero characters. So I my score is a six. I'll go with a seven. I think, you know, Josh Brolin was uh, fantastic in the role. Kind of limited on the dialogue, but he kind of sold everything with his face, and that was kind of the point of it all. Because when you see Cable drawn out in the comic, and then even in the X-Men TV show, it's all about his face and how serious he looks, and just the the way that Brolin got those, like, creases in his eyes. Ah, it, was, it was perfect the way he looked. Um, and then, of course, with uh, Ryan Reynolds, I thought he was just, you know, uh, funny as ever, and just making me laugh, and just all the little things, and all the little jokes that he slips in. I couldn't help but laugh, and you know he does do some heroic stuff towards the end, and he was willing to make the cho- the you know the choices that some of the X Men are not willing to make, like killing the the dude from uh, the Essex Association, whether or not he was a pedophile. He probably was a pedophile, to be honest, but um, yeah, he's he's willing to do the the tough things despite being his kind of asshole, dickish ways. He kind of redeems himself at the end. I thought so. Seven for me. All right, let's talk about the villains. I don't think there's really a lot to the villains. I think Juggernaut is actually used better here than he was in The Last Stand, and after reviewing all the X-Men movies, that is the decision that I've come to. Despite the fact that we see Juggernaut literally show his ass in this movie and kind of die in a horrifically, comedically funny way, I still think the Juggernaut is used better. We get a cameo from Black Tom Cassidy and some hints at Cable possibly being racist, even though Black Tom Cassidy is white. Cable is teased. Um, as kind of a villain, but ultimately he's regarded as a hero. There really isn't a lot to the villains. We have uh, the, the pedophile, as we will call him. There really isn't a whole lot to his character. So much of the focus is on Deadpool that we get almost nothing from the villains. So I don't even feel necessarily comfortable talking a lot about this. I settled on a four because I did like the performances of Black Tom Cassidy. I liked what they did with the juggernaut. And I, I was amused by the scene at the end as they as they killed him horrifically. I'll go with a seven. I think, you know, Josh Brolin was uh, fantastic in the role. Kind of limited on the dialogue, but he kind of sold everything with his face, and that was kind of the point of it all. Because when you see Cable drawn out in the comic, and then even in the X-Men TV show, it's all about his face and how serious he looks, and just the the way that Brolin got those like creases in his eyes. Ah, it was, it was perfect the way he looked. Um, and then, of course, with uh, Ryan Reynolds, I thought he was just, you know, uh, funny as ever, and just making me laugh, and just all the little things, and all the little jokes that he slips in. I couldn't help but laugh, and you know he does do some heroic stuff towards the end, and he was willing to make the cho- the you know the choices that some of the X Men are not willing to make, like killing the the dude from uh, the Essex Association, whether or not he was a pedophile. He probably was a pedophile, to be honest, but um, yeah, he's he's willing to do the the tough things despite being his kind of asshole, dickish ways. He kind of redeems himself at the end. I thought so. Seven for me. All right, I I would give this a four, and I think it's for all the reasons that I mentioned. Let's get to the story. 
I, I, it's, I think it's really interesting just the way that this movie start, starts off with Deadpool. We get Depender again involved in the action at the very beginning where he returns uh, to play the cab driver and we get some funny interactions between these two. I do kind of wish that Depender had gotten a little bit more to do. I kind of feel the same way about uh, Teenage Warhead and Yukio. This is one of the few same-sex couple portrayals that we have had, especially in a Marvel movie, that's something that we really haven't seen yet in an MCU movie specifically. So I'm hoping that there is a way to incorporate that more into the MCU as they continue to move forward. As far as the rest of the story, I don't think they manage the tone nearly as well. And I know that I'm in the minority on this. I know that a lot of people feel very differently. I think a lot of the heart seems to be lost um, should we get, care about Vanessa dying given the meta commentary? That's one of the big questions that I ask. Should we care about X Force, or is it supposed to be hilarious given the way Rob Delaney's character is treated? Like specifically, Rob Delaney's character, Peter, like he dies horrifically, but then when Deadpool goes back and changes the timeline, he saves him, and he's the only one that he saves, and it's bizarre to me that that's the only thing that, I mean, it's just, this movie feels like it's all over the place. There are other story beats that I want to talk about, but Brian, I'll let you speak on anything that I just discussed. Yeah. Once you go like 10 minutes into this movie, I realized that, okay, it's, it's a different tone and I'm accepting it. Cause like, I just wanted to laugh when I want, you know, when I see a Deadpool movie, I just want to laugh, you know, at this point. Yeah. The first one it had some touching moments and some romantic stuff, but at this point, when I just see Deadpool, I just want to laugh because I, I find it's him so funny, you know. It's just like give me give me the jokes and whatever, and I get it. Like they kind of went, you know, they put the they put like the story kind of like to the side, you know what I mean? It wasn't as important. It was more about the jokes and like the sight gags, and I, I get that kind of thing. So I'm willing to accept it. Um, you know, it's not a strong story at all. Believe me, like that that's I'm giving this a six. So it's like it's not like it's amazing writing, and I know it's not amazing writing. But I just accept it as like a silly, stupid comedy. And sometimes you just need that, you know what I mean? Just to laugh or whatever. And this kind of fits the bill for me. And it's great to just put on the background. And every now and then when you do pay attention, you just find yourself laughing at everything. So even with the juggernaut, even, you know, all that kind of thing. And kind of, you know, kind of exposing him at the end with his ass and everything. And it, it made the juggernaut seem kind of like jobberish at the end. But at the same time, it's like it's a stupid comedy. Of course, they're going to end with, like, you know, shoving something up Juggernaut's ass. You know what I mean? It's a Deadpool movie. You expect that nowadays. Right. And I don't necessarily have a problem with that. I mean, like, I get it. I get that they are going for this this kind of humor. But I think there are also times when they are they are trying to go for the, for the heart of this movie. Like, when they have Vanessa and Wade interact in the afterlife, I guess, for lack of a better term. That's what it is. And she keeps telling him that he isn't ready. And eventually, at the end, he is able to cross over. But I guess Deadpool finds his greater purpose in being able to take care of Fire Fist and do whatever he's going to do, whether it's create this X-Force team with Domino and Cable. And that's kind of ultimately where we pay things off. But they were clearly going for a lot of different things. I think they were commenting on some of the the harassment stuff that was going on, especially with the references to the, the bad guys being pedophiles i think there's clearly some of that going on i do love that josh brolin does time travel both in an mcu movie and a marvel movie that is not an mcu movie as of course in avengers endgame he did some time traveling from 2014 and in this movie he comes from the future back to the past so that that also amuses me greatly that josh brolin has done time travel in multiple movies uh i guess you would say the last three movies that we've seen josh brolin in were all involving him time traveling correct Endgame, Infinity, Infinity, Infinity War. Really Infinity, Infinity War, he really didn't war. He didn't really time travel, though. He, he time traveled for, like, one minute just to kill Vision again, which was hilarious. <laughs> I mean, hilarious is not the way that I would put that. I mean, I think it was kind of mortifying, but I guess, yes, he technically did time travel back one minute in Infinity War. So, yeah, that's that's three movies in a, in a row. I wonder if he did any time traveling in... Sicario, Day of the Soldado, which is still one of the best movie titles ever. Uh, haven't seen it, but it also just reminded me that he was young Tommy Lee Jones in Men in Black 3, which also involved time travel and chocolate milk, but we should never talk about that movie because that was awful. Men in Black 3 is not very good, and I would say the story of this movie is also not great either. I am giving this a 5. 
I think that there are elements of it that do work. I still think that there's some funny lines from Deadpool. And I appreciate what they were trying to do with Deadpool, trying to save this kid's life. But in the end, it really did not work for me. I think from the technical aspect of things, the movie to me feels very strangely paced. I think that there are parts of the action that look solid and better, in fact, than the first one. But I still don't think the look of it is that special. And I think in a lot of ways it feels less distinctive because, of course, there was already the for the first Deadpool. And while I appreciated what they were trying to do with the credits, I've, it feels like putting a Celine Dion song in here is a step too far. See, that's the thing, man. Like, I do not like Celine Dion's music. Nothing against her personally. I do not... I'm not a fan of Titanic. I'm not a fan of My Heart Will Go On. But God help me, did I enjoy like her music video with Ryan Reynolds and the, the stupid song. And the beginning was like this freaking like James Bond opening. And one of my favorite things about James Bond movies is always the opening. Because it's so creative and graphic design-wise. And it's just like really like openly interpretive, you know what I mean? And it's very like you can do a lot with it as like a, an artist or graphic designer. And, like, the fact that they did that and just had these little in-jokes within it and, like, the title credits again. And the fact that it was Celine Dion just had me dying. Like, and, the, and when I heard it and I was like, is that Celine Dion? And I just couldn't stop laughing for two minutes and I missed, like, half the jokes and the credits. And then I had to watch it again later on and kind of read all the stupid stuff. So, to me, like, yeah, that was that was great. Some of the CGI was kind of off. Like, when he had the baby legs, that didn't look right at all. It looked completely off. I think they just kind of, like, ran out of time rendering the legs or something like that. So the visuals, I would give, like, just based on the visuals, a 7. But I just love, like, the, the soundtrack. And I know sometimes people get annoyed with, like, these poppy kind of, like, random soundtracks that don't really fit the tone. But I felt like just the 80s music they picked and then, uh, again, with the George Michael thing and just, like, the... Uh, the AHA thing, and I gotta mention, like, if you get the Blu-ray, and you put in the Blu-ray for the first time, it will appear like the DVD, or the Blu-ray menu is like a VHS, and it's playing, like, with this, like, you know, lower quality grade, and, like, tracking problems, and it's playing, like, AHA take on me in the background, so I thought that was a little nice little touch, too, so for me, I'm gonna give it an 8, um, like, 7 alone based on the visuals, but I like the score, or, like, the soundtrack so much that it just enhances, like, the comedy aspects of the movie, especially the beginning with Celine Dion, so I have to go with an 8. I am giving this a 6, and I think part of that has to do with some of the strange editing choices. The baby legs, it looked fine in theaters, but when I was watching the streaming version of it, I don't know, it, it definitely felt more noticeable that the legs didn't look right, and I don't know what that is, but I think perhaps it has to do with the transfer, but the baby legs honestly looked okay to me in, in the theater. It's definitely not something that seemed totally out of line. I don't know, I think it just ran out of time, like, rendering or whatever, and they kind of just cut it short, and it looked like, like an 8% render of like 100% of baby legs you know what I mean like it seemed like it seemed like 20% of the legs were missing all right so I my technical score again is a six well, let's go to the legacy this is a movie that made a lot of money in a short amount of time and just like so many other sum, summer movies in a lot of ways very similar to the Incredibles I think this was kind of forgotten because uh, there were so many superhero movies in the summer and it really only feels like Infinity War is the only movie from last summer that I think has had any sort of stickiness. I think it made fridging a really well-known concept, and that probably is going to be its most important contribution. Ryan Reynolds also continues to be the only person who can play this role, and ultimately I came down by giving this a six because I think there are some positive elements to it, but I'm not sure ultimately how much it is remembered by people. The way I see it, it comes down to the marketing, because based off the marketing for the second movie, it was just all over the place. Like, they they were putting Deadpool on random covers of other movies and selling them as special editions of that Blu-ray. So you would be you would see, like, a War of the Planet of the Apes Blu-ray cover with Deadpool on it, and I was like, God, I want all these. And I, I'm not even fans of even half these movies. I, okay, I like the Planet of the Apes trilogy, the new one. Okay, but I'm saying there were other random movies I can't even think of right now that had Deadpool on the covers, and like there was all this advertising and all these jokes, and the fact that they made a Christmas movie out of this, like re-editing the movie and a PG-13, or I think that was the PG-13, you know, Deadpool, whatever, just re-releasing the movie in, in such a weird fashion. It had a lot of legs to it, and it made so much money like, on the heels of Infinity War. So I thought that was kind of impressive. Like, I thought it would, like, hurt 
its box office based on being so close to Infinity War, but it didn't. It, it seems like it just has its own audience. It's built in R-rated audience that everyone was going to go to because everyone's a fan of Deadpool now. And the fact that like those crazy marketing, like it was genius. I, I'm going to give it a seven just because it felt like it was an event when Deadpool came out. Like everyone, you see it everywhere. You see the mask, and it just felt like this event for like adults. You know what I mean? I think the fact that it came three weeks after the first, or I'm sorry, the third Avengers, I think that certainly made a difference in the box office. I think there might be slightly different audiences, and I think people are still into the R-rated superhero thing, as the Joker movie has also proven that people, that's kind of what they want in their superhero movies at this point. At least some people do, and I'm not necessarily sure that's a bad thing. I think the the key to the genre surviving and thriving the only way it's going to do that is if it's, is if it continues to evolve and tell different kinds of stories and that's what also a tv show like the watchman is doing it's a very different superhero show and perhaps at some point you and I will uh, will get into that show because there there would there there is a lot to explore and discuss but getting back to Deadpool 2, Deadpool 2, Brian, my total score for Deadpool 2 is a 27. Mine is a 34, and I kind of that kind of shows that reflection of what you were talking about earlier. You're probably in that minority of like people who are disappointed with it, but I was just satisfied with what I, what I got. And you know, it's it's dumb, it's stupid, but sometimes you need a good laugh, and Ryan Reynolds just delivers with the laughs on this one. Right, and I I don't necessarily think that this is a bad movie by any stretch of the imagination. I think there are some very good scenes. There are there were definitely moments when I was laughing as the movie was going along, but for me it just it never really added up to a, a satisfactory experience. And my hope is that whatever Deadpool three or X Force turns out to be, that they kind of figure out some of the tonal issues and that we can get back to a little bit more of Deadpool one, perhaps with more characters. So let's get to the burning questions, Brian, at least it was better than dark Phoenix, right? According to my calculations about, I don't know, 800 times better than dark Phoenix. That is uh, that is some very good math because I, I had it about 9,000 times better than dark Phoenix. And that should just, that should tell you that I gave this a 27. Just think of what my score for Dark Phoenix is going to be when we review it next year. Absolutely. When I saw Simon Kimberg's name as a producer on this movie, I got a good laugh out of that because I would assume he had nothing to do with this movie, and that's for the best because he sucks. But he got paid, so he did something right? Or maybe he just has a good agent. I don't know. Yeah, he has a very good agent if he's still producing X-Men movies, especially after Dark Phoenix. What is the bigger disappointment, Incredibles 2 or Incre- or Deadpool 2? For me, Incredibles 2, just because I felt like it should have been the Underminer as the main villain. And that was that was the draw for 13, or I don't know how many years, but that should have been the main villain for sure. For me, it's Deadpool 2. I, I will say Incredibles 2 was a disappointment, but at least I liked Incredibles 2. Deadpool 2... I didn't really even like this movie, so I'm going to go on the other side and say that it was not only my biggest disappointment of the summer, probably one of the most disappointing movies I saw all of 2018, given what we saw in the first one and how I think that movie was just a miracle and so hilarious, and the second one just didn't work. So, Brian, here's the most important question of all. What is a picture of Karl Marx doing in the X-Mansion? Um, I think you know, maybe Xavier was just a communist, man. Maybe that's just the, the truth. I don't know. I I don't want to speculate, but, you know, you never know. He is from the 60s. So the big question that I have is, is that is, is Deadpool going to start reciting things about late stage capitalism and things like that in Deadpool 3? I mean, that's going to be what the next question is. But I think I think this is utterly fascinating to me that there is a picture of Karl Marx in the X-Mansion. And if that is canon, if that's there all the time, then what are the political beliefs of the X-Men in this universe, especially given their relationship with the government in Dark Phoenix? I think I'm thinking about this too much. Well, I mean, Colossus is in it, and he is Russian, and he was watching the house, so you never know. So when Colossus is not watching the house, they take the picture of Karl Marx down. That's what I'm to assume then. Uh, maybe he puts it up for good luck as he's is like he's watching the house as like the Guardian. It's kind of like his thing. Maybe he's just like a babysitter with like a like a pet peeve. 
So I really want to go back to all the X-Men movies and now see if that if that picture of Karl Marx is there. You do that because then you have to watch X-Men 3 again. I mean, not all the X-Men movies. Maybe just Dark Phoenix. I mean, we're going to have to rewatch it anyway when for, for our review next year when we decide whether it goes into the Pantheon, the Pile of Shame, or somewhere in between. So we'll figure it out then. We'll come back to this question next year. Yeah, because the big mystery of all, is he a communist or not? I mean, I think that is far greater than the mystery of whether the movie is good or not, because spoiler alert, it sucks. So this will actually give us some extra motivation, and it's a nice tease for the audience. Yeah, 2020, uh, it's going to be an interesting year in terms of uh, talking about X-Men movies, because God knows where it's going to be in the future. (laughs) What did Deadpool 3 look like? I've been thinking about this. I know they tease this whole team up thing, but with the whole universe changing and, you know, he kind of changes the timeline anyway. And, and at the end of Deadpool 2 with the killings that he makes. But uh, I don't know, man. I, I feel like something it has to do with like the alternate parallel dimensions that, you know, I think it has to do with something with Doctor Strange. I don't know. That's kind of something there. There's something there with him entering our or the MCU universe or whatever. And there's something to that. I think that's what kind of it'll be about and kind of incorporating him into this new world. And that's the story to tell. And then everyone kind of kind of travels over with him, maybe in this kind of bubble and bring over Vanessa and everyone's kind of like in this bubble and they kind of transform into our universe and we get, you know, Domino and Cable and all that. I what I would like to see out of Deadpool 3, I definitely want to see it be more of an X-Force movie. I think that that is the logical step to take is to have this be more of a team up. And I think that you've got some really good cast members in this by bringing in Zazie Bates, by bringing in Josh Berlin. I think these are very good characters. Even if you want to bring in some of the lesser characters like Nagasonic Teenage Warhead, continue to incorporate them. I, that's, that's what I would like to see Deadpool three look like. But the big question is how should Deadpool be integrated into the MCU? And there's a number of ways that you can take this question because I think the issue is trying to box this into PG-13 is probably going to be extremely difficult. So are they going to continue to release it under the Disney? Would they release it under the Marvel banner, the Disney banner, which you've never seen before Marvel movies? Is this going to be a 20th century Fox thing still, or how is this going to work? See, I think that, I don't know. I mean, you may have to water him down, but, at the same time, like let's say he just you bring him over, you make the movie PG thirteen. Can you have a character say the F word multiple times and just bleep it out and that be the joke of it all? Like, does that is that effective? Is that gonna be too much? I mean, we see it on South Park like all the time, right? Or at least back in the day they were just bleeping shit out all the time, right? Um, does that add a comedy effect to it all and then maybe you just incorporate it that way? I don't know, like, because if you do that, like, I know there's been rumors that, oh, we got to get Spider-Man and Deadpool in the same movie, but that's, like, two different, like, you know what I mean, audiences. That's, like, a family audience and the R-rated, you know, comic book audience, and I don't know how you can incorporate that in the script. Otherwise, it's going to be just, like, I don't know, Spider-Man's going to have to grow up quick and start using the F-word or something, because a lot of what Deadpool is is that vulgarity you know what I mean? And that's part of his character. So I don't know if he can change that. It's going to be tough. But maybe, I don't know, if they do it on the streaming, can they get away with it? I, I still don't know. They might have to put it on Hulu or something. Whatever it is with Deadpool, they might have to put it with Hulu. Because I know that uh, some of the stuff uh, that can't fly on the Disney network is going on Hulu still. So we'll see. Yeah, there's the, as of this recording, we are still not sure what Deadpool 3 is going to look like. I have a feeling that at some point next year, they're going to make an announcement about what phase five is going to be because phase four, there is a ton of content in phase four, but it's only lasting two years between the fact that we have a new Thor movie, a new Dr. Strange. It's only two years. So we will have to see how this all looks. So Brian, we are done with Deadpool two next week. We are going to talk about another sequel to a Marvel character. This time we're going to be talking about Ant-Man and the Wasp. And I don't know about you, but I completely forgot a lot of what happened in that movie. And even though I've since rewatched it, I'm still not sure if I'm going to remember everything by the time we talk about it. That's so funny. I remember that movie almost beat for beat, yet feeling like it's just filler. Yet I kind of remembered everything about it. I don't know how that happens. It's pretty funny, but we will talk all about that next week. 
So for Brian, my name is Jerome. Thank you so much for listening. We will talk to you again next week. You know, since they killed Ryan Reynolds at the end, does that mean that RIPD doesn't even exist anymore?